Hey, welcome to Beyond the Scenes, the daily show podcast that goes a little deeper into segments and topics that originally aired on the show. So this is what you got to think of this podcast as, right? Like, if the daily show was a mall food court, right? And you got all the different little foods. So you got a Cinnabons, you got a Charlie's Philly cheesesteak, you got an Auntie Anne's pretzel, you got a Jamba Juice. This podcast is that free food that be on a toothpick in front of all them places. You got the food, but you can still go get you a little bit of that. That make perfect sense to me. Today, we're expanding on a topic covered by Daily Show correspondent Dulce Sloan in a Dulce segment about the history of Kwanzaa. Give it a clip. Kwanzaa is the holiday your white friends think your black friends celebrate. But if you'd like to know more about it, I'm happy to tell you. Starting on December 26th, black families gather for seven days to honor their African heritage and celebrate the values of the black community, like unity, self-determination, and Beyonce. And some think Kwanzaa has ancient roots, and it does. If you think doing the mashed potato smoking menthols on a shag rug is ancient. Because Kwanzaa was actually created in 1966 by Molana Karenga. He was a black nationalist leader who changed his birth name from Ronald because no one wants to celebrate something invented by a guy named Ronald. You could even be my best friend. If your name's Ronald, I'm not even coming to your birthday party. After seeing the 1965 riots in LA, Karinga wanted a way for African Americans to honor their African roots and reaffirm their cultural connections. So he created Kwanzaa, naming the holiday after the Swahili phrase, Matunda Ya Kwanzaa, which means first fruit, and then adding an extra A. Reminds me of when I'd copy someone's homework, but change it a little bit so the teacher didn't know I cheated. Kwanzaa is a celebration of African American culture and heritage, but many people, including black folks, don't know much about the history or how to celebrate it. So we want to break that down for you here this episode. To help dive into this conversation, I'm joined by culinary historian and author of the book, A Kwanzaa Keepsake, Celebrating the Holiday with New Traditions and Feasts, Dr. Jessica B. Harris. Dr. Harris, welcome to Beyond the Scenes. How you doing today? I'm doing all right. How you doing today? That is a wonderful Martha's Vineyard pillow you have right there. I will be <laughs> making a request for one of my own. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm sitting on the Brooklyn one. Okay, all right, well, that's fine. Oh, you got them all, you got all the embroidered stuff I got, over there. I got Brooklyn, the Vineyard, and I think over there is Paris, so I got my sacred spots. Nice, nice. Later on in the show, uh, we'll be joined by segment director Chinesha Scott to help us break down the original Daily Show segment that we did on Kwanzaa. But first, Dr. Harris, in your own words, let's just start with the basics. In your own words, explain Kwanzaa to the people. Oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my. Well, Kwanzaa is, first of all, a new holiday, A. It is not a religious holiday, B. It is a year-end celebration, C. So I think those are things that people get confused about. It is a seven-day, seven-night celebration basically that comes out of um, out of a place that Black people were and are, particularly when Kwanzaa was begun, which was in 1966, which is not that long ago. No. So the whole thing is seven nights, seven principles, seven things that one celebrates, seven ways of being in the world that are honored, designed to give a framework to how how we are, how we can be, how we should be, and how we might be our best or better selves. To run through the whole thing, you can go into all of the nights of Kwanzaa, and its language, the language of Kwanzaa, if you will, is um, Swahili. Why Swahili? Because Swahili was taken as a language for communication among all of the different African languages. It was decided that Swahili would be kind of the lingua franca, the way people could communicate. Um, so, guided by the Nguzu Saba or the seven principles, each day, building block of self awareness. So, first night, Umoja, unity. Second night, Kujichaglia, and that took me a long time to figure out how to pronounce, <laughs> self-determination. Mm -hmm. Third night, Ujima, collective work and responsibility. Fourth night, Ujama, cooperative economics. Fifth night, Nia, 
purpose, sixth night, kuumba, creativity, and seventh night, imani, faith. And if you look at all of those principles, they're pretty, pretty good ways to think about oneself and pretty good ways to live in community. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. The idea is to celebrate those things on each night and to move forward with those things. Okay, so then it's one thing for a holiday to start. And as Kwanzaa started, you know, disseminating its way through the black community, you know, I'm myself, you know, I'm from Birmingham. So, you know, okay. we get all the black stuff early. We got the sneak preview Kwanzaa before it went mainstream. We probably had Kwanzaa in 53 before <laughs> dropping 66. But it's one thing to take part in the celebration, but you have shouldered this, I would say, responsibility of going, you know what, more people need to need to know about this. What can I do to help amplify it? So you look at Kwanzaa and you go, all right, like Thanksgiving got the turkey, Christmas got the ham, Valentine's Day got the chocolates. I think those are pretty accurate foods we would associate with most of those holidays. And Easter's got the lamb. And Easter's got the lamb. And chocolate bunnies for whatever reason. I don't know what he's got to do with it. But you notice that Kwanzaa did not have a staple food. Like, why did you, why take that on? Like, why organize annual Kwanzaa celebrations at Queens College? Like, why do all of that for this holiday? Well, I think the holiday is important. Uh, we talk about my teaching at Queens College, but part that sometimes remains unsaid is I literally spent 50 years teaching in a higher education opportunity program. So it was originally a way to get more Black and Hispanic people into the city university system in New York. It was a way to straighten spines a little bit. It was a way to let people have an important moment. Now, why does food come with it? Because we Black people, we eat. Yes. And we are probably most in community and best with each other when we are around a table because it's how we share. It's how we share ourselves. It's how we share our history. It's how we share all of those things. So as a food historian, you know, I'm deep into history. I'm deep into history and I'm deep into history as it sometimes gets told through food. So the idea is to let's take a look at some of those foods Let's take a look at how those foods connect us. What are some of the foods that you settled on? So, uh, you know, let's let's talk about some of the staple foods for Kwanzaa for the people that don't know that, because, you know, Kwanzaa for me was always seen as, oh, that's something them, them really woke black folks do after Christmas who don't want to celebrate Christmas. And then I started meeting people who celebrate Christmas and Kwanzaa. And they go, oh, no, my brother, the Christmas is one thing. Kwanzaa is another. And so... What are some of those foods? Absolutely. Because like, we're all from Africa. So is it a little bit of Caribbean influence? Is it a little, or is it whatever you want it to be? I got it. It's whatever you want it to be. My whole thing was, let's not be so dogmatic. Let's be expansive. Let's share who we are. I mean, in the book, I have what is one of my signature recipes. I try to figure out every time I can fit it in the cookbook, it goes in. And it's a Senegalese chicken yasa which is a chicken that's marinated in lemon juice with onions and then grilled and then stewed. And it's served over plain white rice and it's delicious, but it's a connector because mm-hmm. it connects us with the place we came from. Yes, ma'am. That is to say the continent we came from. But I also have some stuff that's just pure stuff that I like to cook. So I've got a pecan coated roast loin of pork with baked peaches. That comes okay. out of nobody's tradition but my own kitchen. Okay, but so now, I think people how, should be creative. Okay, but now, but but talk to me though about because Kwanzaa's in an interesting pocket where it's it's nestled in the same month as Hanukkah and Christmas, which are two of the big dogs. Mm-hmm. You know, because yeah. they much millennia of history involved in those two Year religions. Year-end celebrations. Correct. So. Do you think that contributes to the fact that people just never paid much attention to the details of the holiday of of Kwanzaa and often get it misunderstood? Well, I think there's that is a part of it, because I think it's there, as you say, with the big dogs. 
it's the new little puppy running with the big dogs. But it's a puppy that's got, you know, those puppies that you see, they got big paws. And, you know, they're yeah. going to grow into a big dog. So yeah. it's kind of like one of those puppies. Um, and it, it has grown astoundingly for, you know, it's, I'm, I'm very bad at math, but 66 to, you know, 2026, 20, not that long. That's within my lifetime, and I'm not that old. So with all of that, the fact that there was no designated food, people were saying, well, eat food out of the African experience. But what does that mean? Does that mean you're going to have the ham? Does that mean you're going to have chitlins? Does that mean you're going to have whatever? So it was about trying to... Well, there you go. And there was something called Kawaita rice that came out of the whole early Kwanzaa experience. I think the first Kwanzaa might have even been held in Brooklyn or in California. I'm not sure of the locust, so don't don't hold me to it. But I know I have a, a cousin who was at the second Kwanzaa, and that was in Brooklyn. You know, so it's all about how how we can find ways to connect because I think we sometimes find ourselves profoundly disconnected. And I think food, and particularly food that appeals to us, is a way to connect. So you start these Kwanzaa celebrations, and you're inviting people over, hey, come over here and learn about something that you didn't know about and have a good time. How, were, how was that generally received initially by Black people? I think initially, remember, we didn't start them in 1966. We started them well into the maybe late 70s, possibly even early 80s. So oh, yes, Kwanzaa ma'am. was not totally, totally unheard of at that point. But the thing was, it was, uh, let's let's be honest, it's a college campus. We're inviting, and because the Kwanzaa that I did was for faculty as much as for students. Students attended, but here's a, here, here's a college thing for you. Because there was going to be alcohol, as in wine, the students couldn't attend because mm-hmm. they'd have to show proof of age and stuff. So that as it went out, it was like another holiday party, another holiday party at Queens College for faculty and staff that grew to the point where students were, in all honesty, sneaking in and having <laughs> a participatory thing. Yeah, students but- had their own Kwanzaa that I participated in a little bit, but this was this was actually the big dog on campus. It got so it was as if not more popular than the Christmas celebration. Part of it was our food, because you know, our food is our thing. And it was always, we didn't cook, it wasn't a potluck. We had it catered. And we had it catered by an extraordinary restaurant that used to do jerk chicken and fried chicken and all of the wonderful things, you know, red rice, jollof rice, all of the kinds of things that we know, eat and love. And other people love as well. Oh, yes, indeed. Talk a little bit about the gift and the curse of commercialization Ah. in the sense that I feel like most most holidays are only as popular as you can put a mattress sale around. (laughs) Like (laughs) there has to be a food or a sale or something related to it to help or at least some napkins or some plates, which sometimes the big retailers get wrong because, you know, every now and then they try to do oh, something yeah. black yeah, well, and don't quite land. Yeah, let's let's not go there cuz there's a whole lot of there there. <laughs> but absolutely. I mean, I think I think part of the problem is because there was no strict 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 you must have this. There was nothing that said it ain't Kwanzaa unless you serve blah blah. Mm. So that gave people a whole lot of leeway. And, you know, I I was kind of there because the book came out in 1995. So, you know, it, it, the book has been out for a while. Um, but it was about being early into the game to say, enjoy the holiday. Spread spread your culinary wings. Try to connect yourself with, with other parts of the diaspora. Invite friends to come and bring. You know, one of the things that's so wonderful is... It is a holiday that is new enough that you can create your own traditions. 
you can create your own family traditions. And that was one of the one of the points of writing the book. There are actually blank pages in the book. That's why it's called a keepsake for people to write down family recipes, for people to write down family traditions, and so on and so forth. Because I think I think we don't do enough of that. You know, a yeah. lot of my friends of other persuasions, you know, have a little file box with the mama's recipes in them or the grandma's recipe and I'll have that. Because we're such an oral people, we don't necessarily write things down. We're getting more to it, but it's not been how we were traditionally. Yeah. So this was like, okay, take a minute, take a minute. Now, the other thing that I did in the book that I am talking with some people about maybe doing somewhere big is I created what I called a healing supper because we don't realize that we got a lot of stuff we kind of need to talk about and we don't talk about it. We sort of put it under the big old rug in the middle of the floor and the pile is about <laughs> as high as Mount Everest and we keep yeah. sweeping stuff under that rug. We don't bring that up. No, don't you no. talk about that in this house. We yeah. don't that, mm -mm, now that, that ain't dinner conversation. We don't talk about that. So I wrote a healing supper that quite honestly, was based on Passover. Passover is about Jewish people talking about getting out of slavery. We don't talk about that. We kind of, that's part of that, what's under the rug in that big old mountain of stuff. So the idea was to take one of the nights of Kwanzaa and to do a supper where we could gather as family, as friends, as community, be it church, be it mosque, be it, you know, synagogue, be it, the old folks home down the street and talk about that because we need to have some of those conversations. Why, why is food, and, and, and we're going to take a break and we're going to talk about your book, but why do you think food is so essential to this holiday? Because family could just get together. Hey, everybody, come over to the house to, this week after Christmas. Yeah, but we do you ever have your test family or... ever have your family over to, around to the house and not have no food? I You're think right your family that. would put yeah. you up by the scruff of, <laughs> scruff of your neck. It's like, he done invited us over here and all he don't even have a cracker. That would not be correct. So food has to be a part of it because food is what we do when we gather. For many African-Americans, food is how we show love. We might be all unable to say, I love you, baby, or uh, you're my family and I want to be with you, but we can bake you some macaroni and cheese with the good mm -hmm. recipe, you know? Yeah. We can serve you some ham if we still pork eating people, or we can make some greens with a turkey neck in it. But we will show our love by food, through food, with food very often. That's true, because even when you're in trouble with your mama, at the end of the night, she's still gonna say, go on in there and get you some food. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. After the break, I wanna talk with you a little bit more about uh, your book, um, on Kwanzaa. And also I want to talk a little bit as well about the founder of this celebration and everything that comes along with that as well. This is Beyond the Scenes. We'll be right back. Dr. Harris, your book, The Kwanzaa Keepsake, it not only contains recipes, but it also has ways that families can celebrate. Like, do you think this helps answer the question, what is Kwanzaa? I think a lot of things about Kwanzaa, the thing that kind of struck me, you know, Paul on the road to Damascus getting hit, I don't have kids, but I realized that if I had, was raising young black children, I would want them to have something that could straighten their spines, something that they could, you know, sort of hold tightly to and say, okay, I got this, this one's mine. I got this. I can I can learn through this. I can go deep with this. And I think it's an unformed in a way holiday to the extent that people can craft their own way of celebrating it. And I think that crafting is what makes me or what made me be able to write the book. I read all that was written about Kwanzaa at the time the book was written, which is 1995, and, and at that point it was like, there's some room to make this thing what we want it to be, individually. 
it's definitely not one set way, but a celebration in a number of ways uh, to do something. There's a wonderful article from the New York Times a couple of years ago, written by Nicole Taylor, about the five Kwanzaa celebrations around five Kwanzaa celebrations around the country, where they went into black home after home after home, and just documented. All right, what y'all doing over here? How y'all celebrate? All right, what y'all doing over here? Funny, Roy, is, and I've known Nicole Taylor for years, in fact, before she wrote that article. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I totally get it. You know, I mean, and and the thing was that in all of those homes, it wasn't the same thing by a long mm-hmm. stretch. You know, I know people who are Jewish and Black who have Kwanzaa celebrations. Nice. You know? If I'm a family and I celebrate Kwanzaa and I want to invite another black family over to rock with me for Kwanzaa and they may not be into Kwanzaa, what is the best approach to breaking the ice on that? Because I'll be honest, when I was coming up, I thought Kwanzaa to be something that the brothers who wear dashikis do. Mm-hmm. Like that was the perception of it at Florida A&M. When I, when I became 18, 19 and Kwanzaa became a more prevalent thing in college, it seemed like something else. It seemed like another religion almost. Like, yeah. how do you how do you break through to people in a way that doesn't feel intrusive and doesn't feel, this is a terrible thing to say, that don't feel, how do I not feel, come across as a Jehovah Witness talking about, do you want to hear about your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, come on. It's like, well, my approach was very simple and I, I sort of backed into it, recognizing that I don't have kids. I'm a single woman live by myself. I don't necessarily like candles every night. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't have people in seven days because seven days is like, that's about six days too many for me. But I discovered that I had a New Year's Day party that I was giving. And the New Year's Day party that I was giving, I did start lighting candles. I did start pouring libation to, well, I pour libation to ancestors because I'm woo-woo like that. But I mean, I did all of those things and I realized you're having a Kwanzaa party. You're just not mm-hmm. calling it that. So somehow it's in the uh, T.S. Eliot, the naming of cats. You know, it's like, it, it's sometimes it's Kwanzaa because you call it Kwanzaa, you know? Yeah. Sometimes it's Kwanzaa because it fits the spirit, the spirit of the Feast of Karamu, the spirit of things. And so that's kind of was my approach. I'm a very kind of, if you will, iconoclastic Kwanzaa celebrator, even though I've written a book about it. I am not necessarily dogmatic. I think that I think that that's part of the beauty of it is that it can expand. It can take in some of your old family traditions and it can it can amplify them. And it can so, allow them another way to continue to exist. So then to a degree, what you're saying is that a lot of black families are already practicing the principles of Kwanzaa. They may not do it in this specific week, but y'all already got the flow and the rhythm and the tempo and the activities are already set up. You got it. Self-determination, cooperative economics, you know, by black. That's cooperative economics. We need to be thinking about that. You know, faith. Lord knows, you know, my grandmother with her Bible. Faith, serious faith, square business, creativity. I ain't even going there because we have to do five more shows. <laughs> but I mean, you know, the bottom line is we do this. We got this. But how important, like, why is Kwanzaa so important to the black community? Because because in the segment, right, in the Dulcine segment, we talked about, you know, the founder of Kwanzaa, Dr. Milana Karenga, and we made reference to his complicated past with abusive crimes against women. But people have learned to separate the man from the holiday, as far as I can tell. Correct me if I'm wrong. But what is it about Kwanzaa that's so powerful that even in the age of cancel culture, we're kind of like, OK, the founder was a little off, but this right here is still something worth doing and spreading. Well, I mean, I think I'm going to give you an analogy. Do you sit? down through Michael Jackson singing Beat It. I don't know, somehow or other I start shaking and my foot starts tapping and I'm in trouble. So, I mean, what do we do? Yeah. What do we you do? Separate the man from the music. You Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, the bathwater is funky. 
funky, funky, funky. Mm-hmm. But the baby may need, you know, may deserve a little life. Go, let's let's go back real quick. Now, wait, wait a minute. Now, how are we able to celebrate Kwanzaa, even if you're black and of Jewish faith, or you're a black Christian, or you're a black Catholic? How is it that this celebration is able to cross religious lines as well? It is a secular celebration. It is not a religious celebration. First and foremost, that's the thing that needs to be said. It is straight up secular. You can be, you know, Buddhist. You can be anything along the spectrum, including atheist and agnostic, and still celebrate Kwanzaa. All right, last question before we go to the break here. Can I have a spades night during any night in Kwanzaa? At my house, yeah. Okay, then boom, there we go. You said any <laughs> celebration can be a celebration. Hey. You already celebrate, not celebrate with spades. There you go. Uh, <laughs> spades and have a big whisk game going on on the side. Oh, so, so, yeah. Man, you're talking clown now. Nah, yeah. You about to be my partner. See? I can already tell you play cards. See? See? There you go. <laughs> you're going to be gonna be my spades partner. You're going to be my spades partner. <laughs> no, 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 no. Here's the thing. I don't play cards. I, I have no memory. I know, I know, I know. You're going to kick me out now, but. No, what about Uno? I'm willing to Uno? learn. No, no, no. I'm okay, good. that's all we I, need. That's I'm, all we need. I'm, I'm about there with go fish. I'm, I'm okay. the, the, the pitiful. You said any celebration is a form of Kwanzaa. So we going to celebrate go. go fish. No, yo, I, <laughs> go fish. Go fish. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much, Dr. Harris, for coming on the show with us today. We appreciate you for going beyond the scenes with us. After the break, Chinesha Scott, Daily Show segment director, will be on to break down what it was like shooting this segment. And we need to talk a little bit about her growing up in a Kwanzaa house. It's Beyond the Scenes. We'll be right back. Beyond the Scenes, we're bringing it home. Talking about Kwanzaa, or as I pronounce it the first time, Kwanzaa. I don't know why I added a letter, but that's what we do in Alabama. You've heard the way some of us talk. Now, Earlier, we spoke with culinary historian and author Dr. Jessica B. Harris to help break down the meaning of the holiday and the many ways that that black folks can celebrate it. But now I want to take a closer look at the dual saying segment that inspired this whole podcast episode in the first place. So to help me dive in on that, I'm joined by Daily Show segment director, Chinesha Scott. Chinesha, how are you doing? Yeah. And um, welcome to the podcast. Is this, this your first time? This is my first time oh. on the podcast. Almost my one year anniversary to the day when I shot um, the Kwanzaa piece, piece. So it's a nice little you were, anniversary. You were one of the COVID hires at the Daily Show. And uh, when the office opened back up, I was like, who the hell is that? It, like you just, cause people look different on Zoom. <laughs> You know? Yeah, the, with the with the mask on and the one beige person walking around the office. Yes, that was me. That was me. All right, so walk us through the process of shooting this segment with Dulce, because you know I know this was, if not your first segment, it was relatively early on in your tenure at the show. This was literally my first segment at the Daily Show. I I think I started like December six. I think that was my first day. It was a Monday, and that day I got assigned this piece and it was aired i think at the end of that week so within like 48 hours nice i got the job nice. got a script shot the piece cut it aired that's it daily show that's, that's a daily show trial by fire throw, throw you in the shit <laughs> immediately <laughs> when you were like initially pitched this idea like the thing that i found that was interesting is that and you know and this is me seven years on the show we never talked about kwanzaa before Really? You know, that was the first time. Yeah. We talked about a lot of black stuff. Now, I don't want y'all to think that we don't care about <laughs> black people. But <laughs> that specific facet of blackness, we had not gotten to yet, which I really think is a testament to just how deep the show has been able to go in exploring different cultures and things like that. But what were some of the challenges that you ran into, like just in terms of just putting this together? Um. I mean, personally, I showed up on the job and was the black director and immediately got the Kwanzaa piece. So already I was like, oh, this is my this is my new role at my new job. That's so beat. great. <laughs> That's my beat. <laughs> I do the black stuff. Amazing. Um, and then after after that, it was kind of going through the script and uh, 
A, getting both Dulce and myself on the same page about what we were going to do and, you know, what makes sense and uh, respecting the writer's writing, but also being like, no, some of this, some of this don't work. Um, some of this is not a correct reflection of Black folks' experience of Kwanzaa. And so it's just a matter of like having that conversation and making sure that everyone feels heard in that room, which is, well, was weird because I've been there 48 hours. So I'm like, I don't know how to navigate that necessarily. <laughs> yeah, well, the, I think the thing that our, that our writers are always up against is time, 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 fast, fast. So, you know, things start getting clipped and the nuance isn't always there that you need on necessarily whatever the final, final part is mm-hmm. on a segment. So, well, it, it is a better question first before I even ask you the follow-up question. Did you grow up in Kwanzaa? Did you celebrate Kwanzaa? <laughs> well, that was a funny thing because, like, yes, I grew up in a, like a, a Kwanzaa house with a sort of militant father to the extent that one can be militant with a person who has two kids with a white woman, right? So that that was my that was my Kwanzaa experience. But then also, like, for example, in the script, there was one line about like the original version was. Uh, Dulce attempting to say the word Imani. I was like, we got three cousins named Imani. Like, that's not a difficult <laughs> word for us to say. So trying to figure out stuff that felt natural, but keeping true to the the, the text. So yes, Kwanzaa was, was something that was in my house that I felt. Okay. So then with that being understood, back to the previous question I was about to ask. When we started talking about the nuance of the piece and you being new, what was the challenge of trying to figure out what to cut and what to leave in? Because there's so much about Kwanzaa. There's so much you need to already understand about black people to understand Kwanzaa, but you don't have time to necessarily do both in four minutes. You can't. And, and especially now, because I grew up in a time, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s, so Kwanzaa was a little bit more ubiquitous than it is now. So having the Kwanzaa conversation with a TDS audience in 2022 is not the same as having that conversation in 1995. So you can't assume that people know what the the days are. You can't assume that people know where it came from. Where where did you grow up? I grew up in Brooklyn. I'm from New York. Okay. So, all right, so then, yeah, you from around the corner. So <laughs> did you, like, growing up with a father that was like, we gonna do this black thing, stop all that Christmas shit. Oh my God. Do this black thing. Uh, How knowledgeable were other black children? I guess how involved or how immersed, rather, were other black children in Kwanzaa culture? I don't think I knew a lot of kids that were into Kwanzaa. I also just didn't know a lot of kids because of the way that I grew up. So that was, I didn't get to see or socialize with other kids who were doing like Kwanzaa situations. It wasn't until I was older when I would talk to people who are my same age and we'd like share Kwanzaa stories. So that was different. But I did have a set of like fake cousins who also did Kwanzaa, but they had like the altar and they had the bowl out, they had the cloth out, they did the candles every night. So it was very much like Black Hanukkah in their house. Yeah, like I never had, like the people I knew who celebrated Kwanzaa did not fool with Christmas at all. Mm Mm-mm. Yeah, with a number of different reasons why they just did not rock with Christmas. And they were definitely for Birmingham in the eighties. Let me say this clearly before I say before the next sentence come out my mouth <laughs> for Birmingham in the eighties, they were fringe black. I'm not saying it was out there, out there or anything like that, but these was the type of folks you might see a little Kente cloth on them every now and then, which on a non Kente clawfish holiday or outside of February for a regular quote unquote black person in Alabama, Kente cloth was for special occasions. They was rocking it every day, maybe a dashiki. So it's like, oh, okay, Kwanzaa is for those blacks. Mm-hmm. It's how I grew up associating with the holiday. Do, do you think though, do you think Kwanzaa would stand out more for black people for more? Do you think, Kwanzaa would like stand out more for black people if it wasn't in December. Like that's just a packed month. You got Christmas and Hanukkah. These are two very old and religious holidays that like, do you think that Kwanzaa gets a little bit lost in the sauce and that's part of why it's misunderstood? I I mean, yes and no. A, it's, you want, I mean, black folks want something that's theirs. That's if they're not Christian and if they're not Jewish or if they're not Muslim and Uh, you know, that holiday falls in that area, then yeah, they want something to celebrate. But then also, you know, we like warm weather. So wouldn't it be nice to do 
Kwanzaa in June, we could just put them all together in the hot months and then <laughs> keep them, keep ours in the June and y'all gonna have December and that'll be great. That's fine. <laughs> I, I was talking with uh, comedian Kevin Iso from Showtime, and he has a joke about proposing to move Black History Month to June because it's just better <laughs> better weather-wise. We got Juneteenth. We can move Kwanzaa. We can bring Black History Month. Everything, put it all in one. You know, but I, but I, I kind of like the fact if there was ever the perfect week where you know Black folks are home, you know you ain't, can, you ain't competing with no other holidays, and you know everybody's still in a bit of a celebratory kind of mood maybe that dead man's own after christmas before new year's day that might be the the perfect place it kind of works i mean if you're a person who does both christmas and kwanzaa you did the christmas thing you had dinner you went to somebody's house and then for the rest of the week you give like socks and and paper clips and stuff every day you get a new gift so it's nice yeah it's a nice little continuation there there's there's also this aspect of it to me that i also think it's if we're just if i'm gonna just be blunt it's just new and it takes time but it's been like 40 50 years now that's a little that's not that new that's not that but in terms of generationally speaking it's only one generation yeah so if it, if Kwanzaa started in sixty six, I was born in seventy eight, which means like that's all right. But, all right, let's say two generations because it's a lot of young grand grandparents out yep. there. These youngins be out there, boy. They be having the sex. <laughs> I, I I wonder if it's just a holiday that needs more time to grow as well. You know, I I, I wonder what the usefulness usefulness of it is now though. Do you think commercialization has diluted it a little bit? Like in an effort to spread the message, it's boiled it down, watered it down a little? I just don't see it. It Like there was, even with not knowing other kids my age when I was younger, celebrate Kwanzaa, I, it still was ubiquitous. Like it was part of the popular culture. We had a language for it. You don't see Kwanzaa specials. There's no very special episode on your favorite sitcom anymore about Kwanzaa. Mm -hmm. It's very much like either you celebrate it because you know about it or you don't. And I think that even Juneteenth has seen more commercialization than Kwanzaa has recently. So I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the usefulness of, of Kwanzaa is now because it almost feels like African cosplay in the way that people don't necessarily need anymore so then you think it's not useful because it's not gaining the level of traction that other holidays have gained across the same amount of time or more that like when when kwanzaa was created it was serving a purpose it was part of like a cultural shift in black power and like look my father was a member of X Clan. So like when I talk about like blackness and black ubiquity, like that my lens about blackness was very, very different. And they came out of that era, that black power movement era. So I like the 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 conversation around blackness now is very different where like you have Black Lives Matter and you had a lot of like West African immigrants and social media that has changed the way we look at being African and being black, the way that we didn't necessarily have 35, 40 years ago. So then we start getting into the specificity of the types of, quote, blackness across the black diaspora and people celebrating their own individual blackness. Kwanzaa, which part of the tenements of it is about unity. Do you think we're less unified or just more self-aware? And so the need for Kwanzaa isn't necessarily the same now. I think it's the I think it's the latter. I think that we have better language about blackness. I think we have better exposure to our African cousins. And so we, it's not necessary. We don't need to fill in the gaps with this holiday that we invented in the same way. But I think that there's still space for Kwanzaa. I think it just needs to shift with the time. I don't think we need to, you know, play African cosplay, but I do think that the tenets still make sense and that we should still be using them and that reframing them that way makes more sense to me. So then when we look at a segment like Dole saying that helps to create conversations around this topic, you know, how important is that in terms of like trying to educate other people about, look, this is who we are. This is what we've been doing, even if we're still a work in progress on evolving some of these traditions. How important are segments like saying to help educate people on what we've been doing up till now? I think it was super important to have that segment, especially the way that it was framed and that this is the thing that we've been doing. This is how it has looked. This is how reasons why it may not be as 
important now, but here are ways in which we can still use it. And so I think that like having that continued conversation is important because if we don't, then we don't, no one knows about it. Like you need to continue that kind of like griot conversation about ho- the holiday itself. Okay. So here's, here's, a, here's a bigger, here's a bigger question. When, you know, talking earlier to the good doctor, you know, and she was talking about, you know, during Kwanzaa, you try to support black businesses and you have potlucks and you have game nights and there's no one way to do Kwanzaa. You just do Kwanzaa. There's no set food, but what, but it is about having food and that being a part of it. Do you think Kwanzaa is still important to the black community in regards to celebrating community, regardless of religion during the holiday season? Well, I absolutely think it's still important. Kwanzaa still has a place. And I think that there's a way to uh, evolve the tradition. So it doesn't necessarily need to look exactly like it looked like 45 years ago, but it can still exist. Like the comedian Carrie Cottett and her sister run Kwanzaa Crawl every year. And the impetus yes. is to, <laughs> the impetus is to support <laughs> black businesses in all these communities. And so that's her way of like creating this Break tradition. Break down what that is. Break down I, okay. what that so, is. So, I'm not, so I'm not gonna... Kwanzaa Crawl is, uh, it, it's a bar crawl for black people. And like you drunk. can bring it <laughs> drunk. Drunk. And it, it get, I mean, I went on Kwanzaa Crawl and the first thing we did was swag surfed into the first bar. So you didn't know like that it's, it's a way of anchoring the tradition of community and supporting black businesses and all that, but doing it in a very contemporary way, which is why I'm like, I think that Kwanzaa has a space, but I think it needs to evolve with all that we know and where we are right now. It just needs to be newer. It needs to reflect the community that it's trying to unify. Beautiful. Well, Madam Scott, thank you so, so much for finally coming beyond the scenes. Thank you for your plants. People you can't see it. She got some nice plants sitting up there. <laughs> you plant people really stepped up during this mobile Zoom era that we're in now. Listen, that, <laughs> it's this. I'm not gonna have children, so I need life in my house. This is how we do it. <laughs> I'm happy to see you, my son, on lease because he is a handful. I'm only. I only do part time. I got afternoons only. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all the time we have for this week. Thank you, Chanisha, and thank you, Dr. Harris, for taking us beyond the scenes on Kwanzaa. See you later. 